So as we mentioned, um, knowing the amount of bacteria uh, and knowing the different phases that the bacteria are going through are important, uh, not only in industry where we're looking at <coughs> metabolic products <coughs> and trying to, to get certain things from them to know uh, how much bacteria we have in a certain space, but also in clinical applications. So if a person has an infection, it's important to know uh, not only what the infection is, but how what the scope of the infection is. Uh, how many bacteria cells are within their blood or a certain tissue sample. So now we're going to take a look at measuring bacterial growth. <clears throat> so estimating the number of bacterial cells in a sample, uh, known as bacterial count, so counting the number of bacteria, pretty simple, is a common task performed by microbiologists. Uh, so the number of bacteria in a clinical sample serves as an indication of the extent of an infection, so uh, how infected a person is with certain bacteria. So also quality control of drinking water, food, medication, and even cosmetics relies on these estimates of bacterial counts. Uh, so we can find out the contamination, so the extent of contamination, and prevent the spread of disease. Uh, so these bacterial growth measurements are actually done on a regular basis in, in various types of industry to ensure that there's healthy drinking water, you know, making sure that the number of uh, organisms and the number of various things are below a certain count, you know, in water and food and such. So there are two major approaches used to measure the cell number. So we have our direct methods, and they involve counting the cells, um, very literally, directly counting the cells. And then we have our indirect methods, and they depend on the measurement of the cell presence or activity without actually counting the individual cells. So uh, both direct and indirect methods have advantages as well as disadvantages. And, and those are specific a lot of times to the application. So uh, some industries will use uh, certain methods and other industries will use others depending on the advantages and the disadvantages. So the first one we're going to take a look at are direct cell counts. So direct cell count refers to counting the cells uh, in a liquid culture or colonies on a plate. Uh, so it's a direct way, of course, of estimating how many organisms are present in a sample. So we're going to first look at a simple and fast method uh, that just requires a specialized slide and a compound microscope, similar to ones that we would see in uh, our regular laboratory. So the simplest way to count bacteria is called the direct microscopic cell count. So direct, you know, directly counting the microscopic cell count, right? So which involves transferring a known volume of a culture to a calibrated slide and then counting the cells under a light microscope. The calibrated slide is called a Petroff-Hauser chamber. Uh, it's similar to a hemocytometer that's used to count red blood cells, if you're familiar with those. So there's a central area, uh, and the central area of the counting chamber is etched into squares of various sizes. And then you place a sample of the culture, the culture suspension, so like in a broth tube, for example. And it's added to the chamber underneath a cover slip that is placed at a specific height from the surface of the grid. And this is all based on uh, the volume of the suspension and then also uh, the way this, this chamber is used. It's set up to where you put a little drop of the solution in there and then you put the cover slip on in the location and then it's possible to estimate the concentration of cells in the sample by counting individual cells in a certain number of squares and then determining the volume of the sample observed. So let me scroll down a little bit. We can finish up uh, these words here by also looking at the image. So here A is what it actually looks like in the hands of a person. This is the Bethauser chamber and this is the slide that's designed for counting the cells. Uh, so remember this is the direct cell count method. And then in B, uh, this diagram illustrates the grid that is on the Petroff-Hauser chamber. So it's, it's made up of these squares. So these are all etched in, and you can see that there are various distances here. Uh, and then you can count the cells within this square here, which is blown up over here. Uh, you can count the cells, and then you can multiply out uh, how many cells. You can estimate then how many cells are in your sample understanding that that would make up a concentration. So it's made up of the squares of known areas, and then you can see that this enlarged view shows the square, uh, and then you can see the red cells are supposed to be like bacteria, then you can actually count the individual bacterial cells. 
So then they actually show the math here, that if the cover slip is 0.2 millimeters above the grid, and the square has an area of 0.04 millimeters squared, then the volume is 0.008 millimeters cubed, or 0 0.000008 milliliters. Uh, since there are 10 cells inside the square, the density of the bacteria is 10 cells out of that 0 0.000008 milliliters. Uh, and then we get this number here, so we do the math. Uh, you don't have to do that math. I just wanted you to understand that what we're doing then is we're taking this square and we're using the math here, using the size of the square, uh, using the number of cells within that square, using the volume uh, that we've put in there, and the volume of the original sample in order to, in, to do math to figure out uh, how many cells would be in that specific sample. Uh, so here it mentions that up here in their words, the area of the squares and the height at which the cover slip is positioned are specific or are specified for the chamber. Uh, so we have to correct it for the dilution of the sample also if the sample was diluted for enumeration, meaning that if the sample was, was so full of bacteria cells that it had to undergo a dilution, then we would have to also do math to account for the dilution. Also, uh, cells in several small squares uh, must be counted, and then the average taken to obtain a reliable measurement. So that was what we just saw in that illustration there, uh, and that figure was just showing one square, the count for one square, and then the multiplication to get to how many cells uh, in the sample. Then uh, a person, a microbiologist in the laboratory, would count another square, and they would do this many times and then take an average of those. So the advantages of the chamber are that it's very easy to use. Uh, basically just drop some solution on there, put on the cover slip and count, uh, and then do some calculations. Pretty fast, uh, again, just going through those steps, and it's inexpensive. So just having a microscope, which is already available, uh, and then using those slides, which are relatively inexpensive. On the downside, however, uh, the counting chamber does not work well with dilute cultures. Uh, so if it's something like a water sample that they're looking at, uh, perhaps you could do many, 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 many of those slides and still never get a single bacterium in there uh, because hopefully the water would be clean enough to not get any. Um, so there wouldn't be enough cells to count in that example. Also using a counting chamber does not necessarily yield an accurate count of the number of live cells uh, because it's not always possible to distinguish between live cells and dead cells or even debris that are the same size under the microscope. Uh, so this wouldn't tell us whether or not, say for example, if it's a sample from the body, it wouldn't tell us whether or not the body has already killed all those cells and those are dead cells, which means the body has fought the infection, or if they were alive cells and the body is having a difficult time fighting the infection. However, uh, in order to help with this, newly developed fluorescence staining techniques have made it possible to distinguish between viable and dead bacteria. Uh, so these viability stains, as they're called, or live stains, are going to bind to the nucleic acids in the cells, <clears throat> but the primary and secondary stains differ in their ability to cross the cytoplasmic membrane. Okay, so the primary stain, which fluoresces green, can penetrate intact cytoplasmic membranes. So the green one, the primary stain, can actually get through a live cell, one that's intact, has its cytoplasmic membrane, and then it can stain that cell. It can get through not only an intact cytoplasmic membrane, but of course it can also get through a damaged cell membrane. So it will stain both the live cells and the dead cells because it's able to get everywhere. Then the secondary stain is applied and that fluoresces red. And so this can stain a cell only if the cytoplasmic membrane is considerably damaged. Uh, so this would be if the body has fought off the infection and it has killed that bacterium by destroying the cell membrane, uh, then our red fluorescence will be shown in those cells. So it cannot get through an intact cytoplasmic membrane. Thus, live cells will fluoresce green because they only absorb the green stain, whereas dead cells appear red because the red stain is then going to displace the green stain on the nucleic acids because it's the secondary stain. So we can look at an image of that here. So uh, what is then used is this fluorescent staining so you can differentiate between live cells, which would be the green again because it passes through the intact cell membrane, and then red cells, which are the dead cells because their membrane has been destroyed. 
and then you can count this. So you can do the same thing. Uh, you can have an area here where you, you set the grid down. You can count the number of viable cells then in the area and then do the same types of multiplication. Uh, another technique uh, uses an electronic cell counting device or a colder counter uh, to detect and count the changes in electrical resistance in a saline solution. So in this case, it's using the fact that something that's alive has electrical resistance, has uh, electrical currents going through it. Um, and so what happens is they put a glass tube with a small opening uh, into an electrolyte solution. A first electrode is suspended in the glass tube, so in that tiny glass tube that they just put in, and then a second electrode is located outside of the tube. And so then as the cells are drawn through the small opening in the glass tube, they briefly change the resistance measured between the two electrodes. So a cell will get between the two electrodes, which will change the, the information going through the two electrodes. It will change, it will have a little bit of electrical change, and then that's counted as resistance. So there's a little resistance as it's trying to get through the cell, and then that's counted. So the change is recorded by an electronic sensor, and then each resistance change represents a cell. So it's also very fast, uh, rapid, and accurate uh, within a range of concentrations. However, if the culture is too concentrated, more than one cell will pass through at any given time, and then that would skew the results. Also, this does not differentiate between live cells and dead cells because it's going to have that resistance regardless of whether the cell is alive or dead. It will just be passing through this hole uh, going from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration. It doesn't matter if it's alive or it's dead. It will go through there and then that change will be measured. So you can see this in this illustration here in A. This is the Coulter counter. So here's our electronic uh, portion that's going to pick up the changes and report them. This right here, this kind of gray outline, is the tube itself. So you can see in here, this is the small tube that has an electrode in it. Uh, here's the hole, this space here, and then here's the electrode in the outside. So then we have our cell solution, our bacterial solution here, and then as a cell goes through this little hole and into the tube, then we see a, a difference in this resistance, in this electrical charge that's going through here. And then you can see it in real life here, rather than an illustration. So you can see the solution here. It's going through the small tube, and then it's picking it up. So here's our electrode and electrode. So direct counts provide an estimate of the total number of cells in a sample. Okay, so we're, we're directly counting cells, but then we do math in order to calculate how much in a certain volume. However, in many situations, it's important to know the number of live or viable cells so counts of live cells are needed when assessing the extent of infection. So we need to know again if the body's actually killed off the cells and that's just a bunch of dead cells we're seeing, or if the body is actively trying to fight off infection. Also the effectiveness of antimicrobial compounds and medication. Uh, so if we're testing whether or not something dies, uh, like a bacterium dies because of the antimicrobial compound that we're putting in a solution, uh, then any of these methods are not going to be um, useful with the exception of the fluorescence which is a new um, one but for example this our, our Coulter counter would not be a good one and um, our other one the slide would not be a good one either because you cannot dis differentiate between living or dead and that's kind of the whole point there uh, or contamination of food and water uh, so again it's going to be important to know whether or not these are live organisms or dead organisms if we're talking about contamination so these would not be uh, the ideal <clears throat> ideal for this circumstance. So let's move on to uh, plate counts then. So we're still talking about counting. Uh, we've talked about a different couple of uh, direct counting methods. This is another one. This is our viable plate count uh, or just plate count. So here, this is a count of viable or live cells. Uh, so the others picked up on live and dead cells, uh, with the exception of the fluorescence staining, which is new. In our viable plate count, we can look at our viable cells or our live cells. 
So it's based on the principle that viable cells are going to be replicating and giving rise to visible colonies when incubated. Uh, so this, we're talking about our plate, our agar plates, where we spread colonies on there and we see, or we spread a solution on there and we see growth. <clears throat> so the results of this are usually expressed as colony forming units per milliliter. So CFU per milliliter, colony forming units per milliliter, and you should know this information. Um, so rather than cells per milliliter, because more than one cell may have landed on the same spot and given rise to a single colony. So when we plate cells, we, we try very hard to separate them out so that one single cell lands in one single location. However, bacteria cells are so small, uh, it's impossible to know whether or not one single cell got there and, and created that colony, or if there were two cells or more cells and then made that colony. So it's indicated as colony forming units. Uh, so the colonies that are on there rather than individual cells. Uh, also, samples of bacteria that grow in clusters or chains are difficult to disperse. So uh, we have our chains and, re and when we smear them on a plate, for example, uh, we may not be able to break apart those very small chains. And so we would have a chain of bacteria cells in one location creating that colony rather than a single cell. So a single colony may re represent several cells. Uh, some cells are described as viable, but non culturable and will not form colonies on a solid media. So for all these reasons, so that's another reason, so some cells are viable, um, but for whatever reason, we're not able to culture them in vitro. Remember, vitro is in a, a plate or a test tube. So for these reasons, the viable plate count is considered a low estimate of the actual number of live cells. So it does count live cells, uh, but it's not very accurate. So these limitations don't detract from the usefulness though because it's very easy to do and it gives a good estimate of live bacterial numbers. So if we do plate something like a solution from a human body, um, if we see a high count number uh, with any of the other methods, they could be dead cells. And if we take those same solutions and put them on a plate and nothing grows, then we would know that those would be dead cells. So it is good and still used, uh, it's still useful. So microbiologists typically count plates with about 30 to 300 colonies on them. So samples with too few colonies, that would be less than 30, uh, do not give statistically reliable numbers, so it's not enough to count on. And then overcrowded plates, so greater than the 300 colonies, make it really difficult to count those individual colonies. Uh, so they may be blurring together at that point, and then you can't count them really as separate colonies. You're not sure if it's one colony or two or more. So when we do plate counts, then you need to know that it's between 30 and 300 colonies because if there are more, they're too hard to count, and if they're too few, then it's just not statistically significant. Also, counts in this range minimize occurrences of more than one bacterial cell forming a, sing a single colony. Um, so in this case, what we're hoping is that um, if that is... <clears throat> If we have colonies between 30 and 300, that it's more likely that they're individual cells that are making the colonies rather than um, 300 colonies, which may have been an immense overlapping of bacteria. Thus, the calculated CFU is closer to the true number of live bacteria in the population. So there are two common approaches uh, to inoculating plates for viable counts. So we have the pour plate method and the spread plate method. So when we look at both of these meth methods, however, um, even though they're different, and we'll look at both of them, they both start with a serial dilution of the culture. And we're going to take a look at serial dilution, and then we're going to talk about the pour plate method and the spread plate method. So when we look at serial dilutions, uh, this is an important first step as it mentioned, so the serial dilution of a culture is an important first step before proceeding to either the pour plate or the spread plate method. Uh, so the idea is here, the goal of the serial dilution is to obtain these plates within the 30 to 300 colonies. Uh, so we want CFUs, colony forming units, in the range of 30 to 300. So if we took, for example, our very first solution that we have been incubating, for example, at ideal conditions, let's think about our E. coli, 
which um, has a massive amount of growth, exponential amount of growth. Uh, it has its uh, doubling time, right? Our generation time or our doubling time is 20 minutes. If we let that E. coli sit in our broth solution for a day, we have made so much growth in that that if we were to plate that out, then it would just grow a bacterial lawn. Um, and so what we would need to do then is take that initial uh, solution, our initial broth solution that we've allowed to sit for 24 hours, say, or even 12 hours would give us a lot of growth, uh, too many, more than this 300 uh, CFUs. What we need to do is dilute that. Uh, but what we want to do is dilute that in such a way to where when we do then count the CFUs, we can get back to our original concentration using math. Uh, so this process usually involves several dilutions in multiples of 10 uh, to simplify calculation. So we want to make it nice and easy for us to be able to do our calculation methods. The number of serial dilutions is chosen according to a preliminary estimate of the culture density. So we kind of guess, uh, given the information we know about E. coli, for example, um, about where it's going to be. And so then we can do the number of, of dilutions and then hopefully get our, our range of this 30 to 300 CFUs from it. <clears throat> so a fixed volume of the original culture, so this is a serial dilution, we're going to talk about what it is now. So what we do is we take our original culture, so say our broth of E. coli that we've been letting it sit for let's say 12 hours, and remember that um, we're going to have this log rhythmic growth, right? Uh, we're in our log phase. And we're going to take our, our fixed volume of original culture, say one milliliter is usually used. So we take one milliliter of our original culture and we add that to a add that to and thoroughly mix it with our first dilution tube solution. Okay, so for example, some uh, deionized water or some broth that's going to contain nine milliliters of sterile broth or water something that uh, does not have growth in it. I'm going to scroll down a little bit to see if I can see the image, not too far. All right, so uh, we'll talk about it first and then look at the image. So we're going to take one milliliter of our original E. coli growth culture, and then we're going to add it to nine milliliters of sterile water or broth. So this step represents a dilution factor of 10. So we're diluting it times 10, right? One milliliter in nine is going to give us 10 total milliliters. So this is a one to 10 dilution uh, compared with our original culture. So one to 10. So from this first dilution, then the same volume, we can, we can swirl it together, make sure it's uniform. Then we can pull out another one milliliter out of this first dilution then. So not the original culture, but the first dilution. We take one milliliter out and we mix it with a fresh tube of nine milliliters of cereal of dilution solution, so broth or water. Now our dilution factor in this tube is one to 100 compared with the original culture. So we've multiplied it by another 10. So we've taken one milliliter, added it to nine, giving us a total of 10 milliliters. So now we have adjusted or we've changed our dilution factor now to 100, one to 100. And then we continue this process and so we have a series of dilutions, that's why it's serial dilution, and we get this series of dilutions, and then hopefully we will get our desired cell concentration, so we can get an accurate count between that 30 and 300. So then from each tube, a sample is plated on solid medium using either the pour plate method or the spread plate method. The plates are then incubated until we see colonies, uh, two or three plates are usually prepared from each dilution so we can take an average of them uh, because then once we count them on there we can average from each dilution rather than just taking one. In all cases the mixing of the samples with a dilution medium to make sure that our cell distribution is random uh, is very important so you don't want to add your one milliliter and then immediately take out uh, the amount you're going to and then plate it. You want to make sure that it is thoroughly mixed so that you're taking out a sample so that it's random uh, and then that's also why we want to make sure that uh, we do multiple plates per dilution. So let's take a look at this now in this image. So this figure here, figure 9.11, uh, is important to understanding this, I think, in a visual manner. So this would be our original solution. So 
this would be the solution that we have let sit. Uh, say, for example, our E. coli solution, we've let it sit for about 12 hours. Uh, it's very, very, very concentrated at this point. So we're taking our one milliliter out and we're going to add it to a test tube that has nine milliliters of sterile solution. Now what we have is a total of 10 milliliters in this tube. At 10 milliliters, what we've done then is we've diluted it in a one to 10 ratio. Okay, so one, we've taken one milliliter and now it's in 10 milliliters for one to 10 ratio. Then we can take out a small amount of that, 0.1 milliliters, and plate that on an agar plate. And we can see that even at this dilution, it is too numerous to count. It's, it's completely tan there because we have a, a whole bacterial lawn. So we continue diluting. Um, what we do is we take then one milliliter out of this first dilution and now add it to nine milliliters in our second dilution and then we have a 1 to 100 dilution compared to our original solution here, which is what we care about because we want to know how much is in here per volume. And then we can see that if we take, a, take out the same amount, 0.1 milliliters, we still have too many to count. We can't tell where one colony starts and the, others, the other one ends and the other starts. So then we take one milliliter from our second dilution now do the same, add it to nine milliliters here. Then we have a one to 1,000 dilution. We have more than, you can see here, 300 colonies still. So it's still not within our range that will give us a more accurate idea of how many uh, bacteria are within this initial solution. So we keep diluting, one milliliter to nine milliliter. Now we have a one to 10,000, one milliliter to nine milliliter. We have one to 100,000 dilution. So then when we look at this and we plate these, we take out that 0.1 milliliter, the same every time, and we see that again here we have 389 colonies, here we have 50 colonies, and here we only have two. So the only dilution, the only plate and dilution that fit within our parameters of our 30 to 300 CFUs, colony forming units, would be this one here, 50 colonies, which would be this dilution, our one to 10,000 dilution. So knowing that information, we can go to the words here. I'm gonna to try to leave those up there. And our dilution factor then is used to calculate the number of cells in the original cell culture. So again, we want to get up to this original cell culture up here. We want to know how many cells are in that culture per volume. So in our example, an average of 50 colonies was counted on the plates. So up here are 50 colonies, the one that fit between the 30 and 300, on the plates obtained from the 1 to 10,000 dilution. Because only 0.1 milliliters of suspension was pipetted onto the plate, the multiplier required to reconstitute the original concentration is 10 times 10,000. So we took 0.1 milliliters of solution to plate this and we got 50 colonies. In order to get back to our volume in our original solution here, we would have to take this 0.1 milliliters and multiply it by 10 because we took out one milliliter. So 0.1 milliliters times 10 to get us to our one milliliter times 10,000 because this is a 10,000 dilution. Okay, and then that's going to get us all the way back to our initial concentration. So the number of CFU per milliliter is equal to 50 times, I want you to note this here, they put 100, but it's 10 on accent, there's a typo. So because it's 10 times 10,000 here. So our CFU per milliliter is our 50 colonies, because we had 50 colonies, times 10 in our, our, our 10 total milliliters here, uh, but what would also our, our 0.1 times one milliliter, which is what we brought in, but 10 milliliters is where that number comes from times 10,000, because that's a 10,000 dilution. And that gives us the number of bacterial cultures. So our five million cells per milliliter. 
Okay, so the number of bacteria in the culture then is estimated at 5 million cells per milliliter, doing that math. So the colony count obtained from the 1 to 1,000 dilution was 389, uh, well below the expected 500 for a tenfold difference in dilutions. So you can see that what would be expected from a 1 to 1,000 dilution, right, would be 500. So if we do the math from this uh, 5 million cells per, per milliliter and get down there, we would expect 500. But we didn't see 500, we only saw 389. And that just, as I mentioned, highlights the issue of inaccuracy here when we do colony counts that are greater than 300. So this colony count was probably skewed because of colonies overlapping each other. Um, so that when more than one bacteria cells grows in a, a single colony. So that is a serial dilution, which you should be able to do the math for. You should understand what a serial dilution is, uh, perhaps even draw this here for your own purposes to be able to understand where the milliliters are going and what's happening, uh, and understand that you have to have between 30 and 300 CFUs in order for it to be a viable count in order to go through and do the serial dilution. So now I'd like to take a moment and look at these uh, illustrations. Remember, uh, let me back up a moment, that we have our serial dilutions are our first step, right? So we have, actually, if we go back up here, if we're, we're talking about our viable counts, remember we said we want to inoculate plates for viable counts, we can do that either the pour plate method or the spread plate method. But first we had to do a serial dilution. So we just talked about the serial dilution and when we do either the pour plate method or the spread plate method, what we're talking about are getting these plates right here. Um, we're either going to do that in a pour plate way or in a spread plate way. So let's talk about those. So the pour plate way is when we would take our bacterial sample, so that 0 0.1 milliliters that we pulled out of that dilution tube, and then we mix it with warm agar. So in this tube we have nice, soft, warm agar, not so hot to where it kills the bacteria, but just nice and warm and comfortable. And then we add uh, this 0.1 milliliter of our dilution into this agar. And then we roll it between our hands back and forth to mix that sample. Then we take that sample and we pour it into our sterile plate. We kind of swish it around, also kind of allow it to swirl around and to mix and cover the whole plate. And then we incubate it until we see colonies. So this is our pour plate method. So we add the, the bacterial sample directly to the agar, and then we pour the agar plate, and then we're able to see the colonies after we incubate it. Then the other method is our spread plate method. And so the spread plate method is um, also self-explanatory when you know the words here. So in step one, we take our sample, again, our 0.1 milliliters, and we're going to pour it onto our solid medium. So in this case, uh, they're not really showing it because they want to show that this is the bacterial solution, but in here we already have agar. We've already made the agar plate and it's totally solid. And then we're taking our bacterial dilution and we're taking 0 0.1 milliliters of that and we're going to pipette it, um, squirt it out onto our agar plate. Then we can take this guy here and spread the sample evenly over the surface. So we take our spreader, uh, called the sterile spreader here, and we kind of swish it around and make sure that we evenly spread the solution all over the entire plate. And then we take that plate and we incubate it until we see colonies. And then we count those colonies and then that'll give us our colonies per dilution. Uh, so lastly, some, some last notes here on this uh, section is a very dilute sample. So for example, from drinking water uh, may not contain enough organisms to use either of these plate count methods that we've described. So we already mentioned that simply using the slide uh, with the etched in uh, squares may not be a good method for something like drinking water where we wouldn't see that many and maybe completely miss getting any bacteria at all in there. Uh, but then also a serial dilution would just dilute it even more and then put it on the plates and would not be a good method. So in these cases, then the original sample must be concentrated rather than diluted before we plate it. Uh, so this can be accomplished using a modification of the plate count technique, 
called a membrane filtration technique. So as you can gather from membrane filtration, we will filter it using a membrane. So known volumes are then vacuum filtered aseptically, so we don't want to add anything. We don't want to have any bacterial growth, so we have all of sterile stuff. Uh, through a membrane with a pore size that's small enough to trap the microorganism that we're testing for, so bacteria, for example. And then this membrane is transferred to a petri plate, our agar plate, containing an appropriate growth medium. And then the colonies are counted after incubation. So in this case, it's a way to concentrate it rather than dilute it. Calculation of the cell density is then made uh, by dividing the cell count by the volume of filtered liquid. So we would do an opposite calculation to then get back to our original solution, just like we had to do a calculation in our dilution solutions.